Okay, it's uh, 10 after 10, and we're going to start for our next uh, session. The next presentation is Quick Start Guide to the Digital Preservation for Audio. And uh, Sandy from University of Missouri, Kansas City, gonna be the presenter. Sandy, I'm going to um, uh, turn it over to you. Okay. Um, good morning. Um, I want to start off by telling you a little bit about myself, um, just to give you some context as to where I'm coming from on this topic. Um, I, I am the Digital Special Collections Coordinator at UMKC, and I've been in this role since 2013. Um, but prior to that, I spent about 10 years in various capacities as a music and audiovisual formats cataloger. Um, my interest in audio preservation stems from my involvement in the Association for Recorded Sound Collections, uh, which is an international organization focused on the preservation and study of sound recordings. And the topic I'm presenting is pretty symbolic of my transition from a descriptive cataloger to a repositories librarian focused on preservation strategies, which of course heavily involved metadata of another sort. Um, and before I begin, I do want to be clear about what this presentation is and is not. Um, Elizabeth's presentation actually was a great one um, to go right before mine, um, because the first thing I wanted to say is this, um, my assumption here is people have a basic foundational understanding of digital preservation concepts, so I'm not going to go over that in any detail. And uh, in that vein, this is not about how to digitize audio. It is about what minimal steps you can take with the digital audio files you have or have created in order to ensure long-term access. And for those who don't have the in-house capabilities to perform digital, digital conversion for your analog items, it can also serve to inform you about what you can and should expect at a minimum from your vendor. Um, this is not a theoretical pre presentation, but very practic practical in keeping with the focus of the virtual conference. However, um, I'm not so great at presentation titles, so a quick start guide is a little bit of a misnomer, misnomer given that there are usually guides to software or hardware. And while I will be demonstrating a couple of tools to you, I'm not advocating that there are any hard and fast rules about what, what set of strategies or tools you should select for your own institution. You know, it really depends on your institutional priorities and capacity. Uh, rather, this presentation is more of a use case that presents a set of strategies that may get you to achieving what you deem as good enough preservation for your digital audio files. And as an attendee of many presentations, I often find value and insight in use cases. I know there have been many so far in this conference um, that have been very valuable. So, um, and our strategy itself is actually very heavily based on use cases. So I hope this will be meaningful to many of you. Uh, a little context and history here. The Mars Sound Archives was established at UMKC 30 years ago with a gift from Gaylord and Olga Marr. Uh, Gaylord Marr was an associate professor of communication studies at UMKC and was known for his use of historic AV material in the classroom. Our collection today consists of over 350,000 recordings with a focus on the American experience as reflected in recorded sound. It spans music genres like jazz, blues, soul, country, rock, um, as well as a large number of radio broadcast recordings containing news programs, radio dramas, educational programming, variety shows. And these are all carried on a wide range of formats, LP, 78s, electrical transcription discs, instantaneous cut lacquer discs, and open reel tapes. Um, the Sound Archive is part of our Division of Special Collections and Archives, um, but is in many ways its own operation. The director of the Sound Archive, pictured here, Chuck Haddix, is also host of a very popular Friday and Saturday night program called The Fish Fry, which features blues, R&B, soul, jazz, and Zydeco on local station KCUR. He is also a jazz historian, publishing many articles and books, and um, Chuck was very instrumental in establishing the archive along with former library dean Ted Sheldon. Uh, Chuck is the first and only director of the archive, overseeing it, curating all collections, and providing reference assistance. Our preservation studio was established shortly after the sound archive was, and we've had an audio engineer on staff ever since. But the position has been primarily limited to performing digital conversion projects. Up until recently, we had one other staff member overseeing the work of the student assistants and also an operations manager of sorts. However, with the recent vacancy in the operations manager position, we were very fortunate to be able to upgrade it to a librarian position. 
So now in the 30 years of the Sound Archive's existence, we finally got an experienced librarian to oversee the preservation studio, gain intellectual control of the assets of the Sound Archive, which is a monumental task, uh, given the lack of the position prior to, and to participate in establishing a digital preservation program at UMKC. Um, so how do we get to this point of seeing a need for improvement in our work? Well, a confluence of factors. I had moved into the Special Collections Division permanently um, from finishing up a grant project working with the Sound Archive. Um, um, and my position was, you know, focused on implementing a repository in a public facing site for our researchers. Uh, and when I started to look at this issue two years ago, we had just designed and configured our open source repository and I was very busy starting to establish workflows, the metadata remediation and enhancement process and defining other specifications to get our digital still image collections ready for ingest. And one major but very basic issue I came across was the lack of standardization and file naming across all of our digital files. So our image collections were not uniquely named, but dependent upon the context of the nested file folder structure. So there were a lot of 001.tips. And when I looked across to our digital audio files, it was a little better. Um, there was at least an attempt at uniqueness, but it still required interpretation based upon the established file folder structure. So you can see here, um, I've got circled the 24 bits So we had um, them separated into directories of 16-bit and 24-bit, but they have essentially the exact same file name, so they were not unique. And this is actually what kicked it all off. We saw this as an opportunity to address organizational challenges by unifying practices and standardizing the management of digital files across our division. So for us, the best strategy to move forward was to conduct a self-assessment and gap analysis of our policies and practices. Uh, this hadn't been done in well over a decade when we had last brought in a consultant. This was before my time. And a lot had, has happened in that time in terms of establishing best practices for audio preservation. Um, however, with pressure to migrate our legacy digital content over to our new system, I was motivated to resolve this issue in a fairly lightweight way. Um, being fully aware of many of the standards and recommendations available, of which I'll provide links to many at the end of the slide set. Uh, I decided the most efficient approach was to review a resource that contained interpretations of these higher level recommended practices and strategies to formulate a best practices framework. And that was the Sound Directions Project, which is a uh, joint undertaking of Indiana University's Archive of Traditional Music and Harvard University's Archive of World Music. Um, they were supported by grant funding and their goal is to create best practices and test standards for digital preservation, establish programs for digital audio preservation that uh, were sustainable and interoperable, and of course to preserve their high value unique field recordings. Um, so what they had done was interpret these high level documents and apply them practically to their own programs and that culminated in a published work of their best practices and recommendations in this freely available document, Sound Directions, Best Practices for Audio Preservation. And uh, what really struck us was that one of their motivators, which I have on the screen here, was that they wanted the, what they did to be generalizable to other institutions who couldn't necessarily redesign their studios or their staffing situation. So this really resonated with us. Um, although Sound Directions had been published seven years prior to when we took on our assessment, it was far ahead of where we were in terms of established policies and practices. So it made a lot of sense for us to use this as our measuring stick. Um, and my approach was to part partner with the person doing digital conversion of our audio to conduct this gap analysis. Uh, although we had reviewed the entire document, uh, we used chapter eight, which contained the summary of the best practices to create our own document and record uh, the following, an assessment, which basically contained what we currently do and or the difference in practice from the recommended best practice, recommendation, what steps we should take to comply, or if we would defer action until a later time, stating the reason, and that reason was often uh, lack of capacity. Um, update, um, notes on what steps were taken, uh, the outputs and outcomes or further decisions and rationale. So you can see the example here, the assessment isn't very detailed because we simply did not indicate the derivative type in the file name. 
but we did record a recommendation and update with some documentation that was developed to support that recommendation. Uh, we went about making those decisions and recommended changes by defining some principles to guide us in that process. So first we needed to recognize and understand what resources we could commit while balancing other priorities. So we knew that the digital conversion process would change somewhat and that the people doing that would need some training to incorporate these changes. Um, but at the same time, we needed to be cognizant of this ex expectation to move forward with our legacy migration um, as our software uh, had been abandoned and we were using DLXS. I know other institutions um, I was using the same abandonware. Um, and our, that server was no longer warranted. <laughs> Um, so with that said, the approach needed to be iterative or incremental. We weren't looking for a lightning rod solution. We needed to be sensitive um, to ensuring we weren't making too many changes all at once. And so what we were looking for was a first step that we could build on later. Uh, we also decided that whatever tools or applications we use should help automate the process as much as possible to make it more efficient. And we wanted to emphasize the use of standards and best practices to be applied to specific recommendations, which also would result in less overhead management and more efficiency. And finally, we had to define what good enough was for us. Um, again, what's the first step here? And for us, good enough was the ability to answer these questions from examining the digital file itself without inventory lists to refer to, which <clears throat> we sometimes don't have. Um, can we quickly determine what it is, what collection it's from, for instance, file format, file use? Can we determine what content is on it, whether what it says it contains is accurate, whether the file has changed in any way? And finally, while not evident in looking at the digital files themselves, we needed a mechanism in understanding the process. Um, the answer to those questions look like this. Uh, these were the things we wanted to make some progress on. What we needed to do was, first of all, address the issue that initiated this assessment of our work um, and assign unique and meaningful file names to answer the basic question, what is this? Uh, we wanted to embed some catastrophic metadata to answer the question, what does it contain? Uh, I personally like the term catastrophic because the challenge I was facing was that I was coming in disrupting the many years of work of our audio engineer and asking him to do something that looked to him just like extra work. Um, but using that concept of, you know, if the file is corrupted, how we will we know what was lost really helped push the point and gain some buy-in on his end. Uh, we needed to establish a QC regimen to answer the question, is this metadata accurate? And we set out to ensure the integrity of the files to answer the question, did the file change? And also to establish a process for, you know, regular checking of file integrity. And because one of our principles was to leverage efficiency, it was imperative that we select tools that could facilitate and automate many of these processes. And finally, it was incredibly important to make sure that we documented our decisions, specs, and process to answer the question, what is our process? Um, documentation is the other st side of the strategic coin to practicing digital preservation strategies. Um, how valuable and strong can that strategy be if you don't preserve the decision and process itself, right? So we have to be good stewards of the process to be good stewards of the files. And that means robust documentation. Um, okay, at this point I'm going to whiz through because I really want to devote some time to demonstrating the tools we selected. Um, I may have been a bit ambitious here, but I've been told I have a little bit of leeway on time. Um, so. Um, you're going to see a little of our documentation, and I'm more than happy to provide those to anyone who wants them after the session uh, because they won't be here for very long. Um, so to start, we pulled together a list of best practices for file naming so that any exceptions could be resolved using this guidance. Uh, we established a template, created a profile defining each element in the file name as well as examples. Um, each element we selected not only helped to design uh, or to establish uniqueness, but told us what collection the item was from, what the analog source object ID was, which part or sequence of that source object it represented, what derivative type. Um, so again, we wanted to be able to quickly look at a file and tell something about what it is and its source. Um, there are many freely available tools for batch renaming of digital files. I myself use Advanced Renamer. 
Um, following our principle to use available standards, the guidance offered by the Federal Agency's Digitization Guidelines Initiative, or FAGI, was a good fit, given that these guidelines were specific to embedding metadata in the BEXT and List Info chunks of the broadcast wave file. Um, broadcast wave being the accepted standard that we already use for our digital audio files made this a no-brainer for us. So we established a local implementation that heavily followed the mandatory and strongly recommended elements from the FADGI guidelines. And in order to embed this metadata, QC it, add fixity information, we had to select some tools to facilitate these functions. So BWF MetaEdit was a natural fit given that it's a free open source tool that allows for embedding, validating, and exporting of metadata and broadcast wave files. Um, it works with many operating systems, which was great for us because we run both Windows and Mac machines in our two studios. And uh, we used AV Preserve's MDQC to help automate the QC of the embedded metadata and AV Preserve's Fixity, we ultimately didn't end up implementing, but it is an incredibly simple and effective utility that monitors file integrity uh, with regular validation of checksums and report generation. Um, we decided not to use it because of our current workflow. Our digital assets are accession or created locally and then they're transferred to a server maintained in Columbia, Missouri. It's as part of our cooperative and shared effort in the UM system. So um, we decided that we just needed to calculate a checksum and then uh, check it on transfer. And then um, from that point, our library system support in Columbia, they perform the regular, regular fixity checks and provide reports to us using a service, uh, as a service, using a tool they selected. Um, they could very well have used AV Preserves Fixity. Um, um, but I am going to demo it because I think it's important. Um, it's an important tool that uh, could apply and be useful to many other people. Um, so at this point, I'm going to uh, step out for a demo. This is from IT Crowd, if you don't recognize it, one of my favorite shows. Um, let's see. So. Again, I'm going to try to demo these three tools. I do want to say um, that you know these are rel relatively simple. Um, they have really excellent user guides and video tutorials, so I might be going kind of quickly through this. The point of the demo is really for you to get a gist of what they can do and then explore it further on your own. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, BWF Meta Edit. Um, Again, it was developed by FADGI and supported by AV Preserve, and in a nutshell, it allows you to embed, validate, and export met metadata and broadcast WAV files. So it's a pretty simple interface here. Um, there's a number of ways that you can open files. You can open, select them one by one. You can, um, or multiples. Uh, you can open a directory. Uh, you can even, and I'll show you here, just you know, drag them over and um, it'll open. Let's open it by directory as well, um, just so you can see. I'm going to select that folder and then it picks up the other two files. Um, so you have this graphical menu on the side, um, which represents most of the functions you're going to want to use. Um, there's a few more options, um, but most of it is mirrored up in the admin menu. Um, it's going to default to landing on the technical metadata that you can see here. What we're going to focus on is the core metadata. Um, uh, this contains your BEXT uh, and list info uh, data. So um, you can see I have two files that have some embedded metadata and two that um, are lacking some metadata. Again, this is a really simple tool. So it's, you know, basically editing, adding metadata. So um, I have one here. So you can simply double click and you can import a file or you can free text add. I'm just going to add some information so you can see that, um, that it's there. And once you've add, done any editing, uh, it'll highlight the cell green um, so that you know um, what has changed. And until you save it, once you save it, it'll um, not be green anymore. Um, you'll also see what's happening here is um, one of the other great things about this tool is all the built-in instructions. So these are actually the FADGI recommendations, which are built on the European Broadcasting Union tech guidelines there. Um, another thing that you can do in terms of editing is you can fill down. 
So if you right click, you can fill all open files with this field value. And again, it's highlighted green because you made a change and you haven't saved it yet. Another kind of editing, and this actually speaks to the validating capabilities, is for instance, anything that's formatted like with dates, it pick, um, opens up a date picker. Um, so you can select the date, you can free text, but if I tried to change this to something not valid, it's expecting numbers and formatted year, month, day. Um, you can see here that it's you know, kicking out this error message malformed input, and it won't actually let you change it. So that's kind of the built, some of the built-in validation options that you have. Um, let's see. The other things I wanted to show you here are the preferences. These are, um, actually I wanna show you up here. You can actually set preferences like um, uh, for your default preferences or you can actually do them by instance. So the ones that you have open, you can make some changes here. So I'm gonna open up this preferences just to show you what they have. This is actually, the default is to show you every possible uh, field. Um, so for technical and core, but you can modify the display if there are certain ones that you don't wanna see. And uh, these are the rules. So right now I only have the requirements that we're following the requirements. So that's the kind of validation that will be happening. But if you also follow the recommendations, you can select that as well. Um, the reason why the only the WAV files came in when I selected that directory, even though there were some JPEGs in there, is because this is selected. So you have some options here that you might want to review when you um, start working with this tool. So the other thing I want to show you is MD5. So the MD5 calculates on the audio bitstream only. Um, so that means... Um, when you do a uh, when you verify you check it it's checking on the audio bitstream um, so if you make changes to the metadata it won't fail so right now I don't have any um, so if I select that it says some files are open you can go ahead and have it generate and here's um, one of the clunky things is if you have too many files open it kind of takes it might take a while um, for it to calculate the checksum so that's kind of spinning. You can also have it, this is only um, generating the checksum, but it's not actually storing it. You'll want to select embed here um, if you want it to actually store it. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that and save. So where that shows up is in tech, and you'll see now that it's green here. This is the uh, calculated MD5, and then th this is the MD5 as stored. Uh, so that's another thing you can do. Um, let me see if there was anything else. No. Um, the other thing um, is the help is really uh, great in this tool. Um, so you can see here's all the guidelines from the FADGI um, recommendations for BEX and list info. Um, you have an explanation of the errors you might see. Um, uh, the options that you um, you have to choose from, you have some explanation there as well, checksums. And then the other thing I wanted to show you is the workflows. This is actually really helpful because we're all pr probably very practical people, so we want to see how are people using this. So they have a couple of workflows that you can look at and think about in terms of how you're going to incorporate it into your work. Because another thing you can do is export that metadata as CSV, XML, um, and then you can also import a core document. Um, so as long as the headers here match the headers in your CSV, um, you can import a CSV file and fill in this information. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. I know that was really fast, but I'm on limited time here, and I want to show you the other tools. So it's saving, and then you'll see that these are no longer, um, these should be no longer green. Yeah, so it's saved, it saved that. So I'm gonna close that. Um, now I'm gonna go over to MDQC, which is, um, it reads the embedded metadata in your file or directory, and it compares it against these rules that you get to define, and it verifies that. Um, so let's go ahead and run this. Um, the other thing I should say is it's dependent upon, upon EXIF tool and media info, so you'll want to install those as well in order to get it to work. 
Um, so I would, it's, again, this is a pretty simple utility. I would highly recommend that you first set your report directory because what it's going to do is once you run it, uh, you scan a directory and it gives, it generates a report and the default for a, pretty much all of their, any utility that they have, um, AV Preserve has that generates a report is to put the report in the directory where the uh, application was installed. So if that's not where you're expecting to see it, then you might want to change it. So I'm going to have it set it to my desktop. So when the report gets generated, it'll be sent to my desktop. Um, so what you want to do is select a reference file. So your reference file is something you want to use um, to set rules on. So you want to select something that has a lot of metadata in it. So I know that the first two files I had had a lot. Um, and then you can set your metadata rules here. So it's just going to take a moment um, because it's reading that. Um, so it opens up this uh, window. Uh, the default is to ignore, ignore the tag, but it pulls, basically extracts all of the um, metadata where you can set a rule on. So you've got a number of options here. If you want to, for this one, I would select is, for instance, is is exactly equal to this. Um, you can also set, you know, exists. We use this one a lot um, because the coding history might change, it depends on the project. So you just want to, uh, for us, we recommend, we actually require that there be a coding history. So we might select something like exists there. Um, you might also select something like uh, contains. Um, and the other thing I want to show you is, um, you know, you can set more than one uh, rule uh, but per uh, element here. So I know this is the, this is the Golden project, um, J. David Golden. So I want it to at least contain whatever and this amount. I'm just making something up here. And then I also want it to contain, um, I don't know, pres.wave because we know these, everything we're running on, the, on this is, uses the preservation derivative. And I'm also going to select something that I know will fail. Um, let's see, title, for instance. Um, if I set it to is, I know these other uh, files actually aren't uh, necessarily, it, the title is going to be different. So I know that's going to fail just to show you what that looks like. Um, so you, all you have to do then, once you're satisfied, is set the rules. And then you need to select your uh, scan directory. So I want to set it to my demo directory. And you can set scan rules. Uh, on the directory and on the file names themselves. So we always set it to, because oh, sometimes we have other files in there, um, so we set it to end with dot wave, because we want it to scan only those rules to only apply to the our wave files. And so you can set the rules. Um, I just want to point out that you can actually save this template as well. If you want to save the rules and the, the scan rules, say you're running a big project and you're getting batches, um, it might be helpful to save it um, and then load the template. So let's go ahead and begin this test. And it opens up a window um, and it runs through and what it does, what it shows you here in the report is actually not much different is which files passed, which failed, and at which point they failed. So again, I set it to title. So you can see, oh, well, the title is similar, but not the same. This was on April 3rd. Um, and other places it failed. Those other two files, uh, if you, you might recall, did not have that much metadata embedded. And then it also tells you uh, where it wrote it to. And this is why it's important to set your report directory. And you can see it's here on my desktop. So that's that tool. Um, basically, um, this is again why it, it, in this case, when I did the scan, it, it ran XF tool to um, extract that metadata. Um, but it's very simple. Um, very quickly, I'm going to Fixity. Um, so Fixity, I know we saw a little bit of that in um, Elizabeth's presentation prior to this. Um, 
It allows regular view, review of stored files, um, so you can monitor your files for changes. I have to run this as an administrator to get it to work properly. Um, and, um, you know, it scans your folder directory, um, and it calculates a checksum, it creates a manifest of that, and um, then you can do an analysis that compares, and, and, and it'll report on new, missing, moved, renamed files, that sort of thing. Um, so again, another very simple tool. Um, I'd say the first thing you want to do with this is set your email set. In fact, you pretty much have to. With this latest version, you have to set your email settings because it is generating a report and emailing report the report um, it needs a server to do that an email server to do that um, this is our this is our sound archive library <laughs> I'm using his credentials um, so you'll need to find that information out the SMTP server and set that up first to create uh, a project um, so let's create a project I'm just going to call it CPN dam and so just a quick review of um, the interface here. Um, uh, here to the left is your project that you created. You can create multiple projects. And then you have your scheduling panel here. Um, you can do daily scans, weekly, monthly. Um, uh, you can set the time that it runs exactly. This is actually military time. Um, so if you want it to be 1 p.m., you'll need to do 1,300. Um, and, uh, you can also select these options, only run it on battery power, or if it's not on battery, run it, battery power, run it upon restart. And then I'm going to deselect this because I want it to go ahead and send me an email, um, whether it, it, there was a failure or not. Um, and then the next panel over is the directory you want to scan. And you can scan up to seven in one project, which is a kind of nice feature. Um, I have to, because I'm in administrative mode, I now need to navigate down to my desktop <laughs> to get to this folder. So that's the folder I want to um, um, scan. And um, you can set up to seven email addresses as well. And it's not per directory, even though it looks like that. It's, you know, for this project, these are the people who are going to be emailed. Oops. Okay. So um, a couple of preferences to know, oh, first you want to save your, once you're satisfied with it, you want to save your project. Um, so you'll save settings and that, yep, and then it'll verify that. And now you've got some preferences available to you. So you can uh, select your checksum algorithm if you want to calculate MD5 versus SHA-256, you can. I'm just going to leave that. Um, also, you can filter files. You, um, you may have noticed here I have some JPEGs, um, but I want to go ahead and have them um, uh, scanned as well. Um, so I'm not going to do that, but you can select ignore hidden files, whatever. So you can filter out whatever file uh, types you don't want. And you can go ahead and run the scan. Um, especially when you start a new project, you want to go ahead and make sure the first time all it does is scan that directory and uh, calculate the checksum. So I'm going to go ahead and run, run it now. Currently scanning, and then it opens up the scanner console. Um, and you can see the files listed here, and then it is um, calculating the checksums. And it actually, again, it'll write, even though I have, it's going to send me an email, it's also writing the report in where I installed Fixity. Uh, there's actually a reports directory there and a history directory, and it'll actually save it there. So it closes that. Um, oh, I have like a minute left. So, <laughs> so let's see. I did, so I, here I have my um, report. There's a summary. Um, this isn't going to tell you much more. It gives you the directory. Um, very quickly, I'm going to make some changes just to show you uh, when you run it again and if you've made any changes. This is why I wanted to keep the JPEGs in here because it'll be faster. So I've now made some changes and then I want to go ahead and run it again.
So it's running that. We'll see how quickly I get that report. All right, and I should be getting a report here. Um, basically, the report will give you, it'll give you a summary, you know, this has been moved, this file name has been changed, and that sort of thing. I'm being told I'm out of time, so I just want to conclude with some um, final thoughts. Um, so, it may be pretty surprising that an institution with a sound archive and people digitizing for decades would not have more robust practices in place already. Um, but is it really? When you consider the lack of resource committed to digital programs, including curation and preservation prior to the creation of my position three years ago, and the lack of resource embedded in the sound archive to implement and oversee this work, it's not really that surprising at all. Uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but the real takeaway is that in order to claim any kind of responsible stewardship over our digital assets, you, seem, you simply need to devote more resources to it. Not just more, but the right kind of resource. We can't expect to keep up with developments in digital preservation if we don't do that. And what we were able to achieve, however minimal, was a direct result of that commitment. And with our new Sound Archive librarian, we'll finally be able to go beyond this minimal effort. Uh, these are the resources. They, they'll be clickable. There's a PDF um, that I've uploaded. You'll have that available. And questions? Oh, thank you, Sandy, for that wonderful presentation. I really learned something um, I never knew before. Uh, now we're going to take questions. The first question I have is, what digital preservation platform do you use to push your digital audio files through once you have done all the work? with the tools you demonstrated? Oh, yes, good question. <laughs> so um, we simply do, this is why we didn't use Fixity. Um, some people use like Bagit to do the transfer over because we are storing our files on a server in Columbia. Um, that's something our sound archive librarian is going to be working with me on um, developing a strategy for because right now we simply calculate the checksum once we've got everything's ready and we're, it's ready to be transferred, and then we um, transfer via FTP, um, secure FTP, and um, then we um, check the checksum on the other side um, to make sure it transferred. And then at that point, um, the um, library systems support people there. They actually um, went with, um, I don't know if people say Quilper, but Fixie, this tool called Fixie, and they run regular checks. Um, so we don't really have a system. We have some strategies that were um, um, pretty minimal, but uh, we're, we're, we're working to build on that. And right now, um, you can see in my bio, we're also like um, in the middle of, we've got a digital preservation planning group uh, through the UM system. Um, but we're really in the beginning phases of just, we just did a phase of learning together and then we're now in the phase where we're actually going to inventory our digital assets and um, then move from there to assess and do some recommendations. So I anticipate we'll be beefing that up um, in terms of, you know, how we're transferring our files and, and the storage and all those good things that Elizabeth talked about. Uh, the next question is, was there a decision to not add basic descriptive metadata besides the title in the embedded metadata? Um, yes, so that speaks to that catastrophic <laughs> thing. Um, so we, it's really about our workflows and then um, going back to being sensitive to making too many changes. So I can tell you right now, the Sound Archive librarian who has only been here a few months is already making some more changes. <laughs> um, and that is actually in terms of descriptive, um, enhancing um, our descriptive metadata, having our audio engineer do more with that. But it's not necessarily going to be in the embedded metadata um, as much as it might be in our inventory and or finding aids. Um, 
So the point of, of the metadata in the, that's in the file, that's embedded, is really for us to determine you know, if there's some kind of corruption or something happening, what, what is this thing? You know, and not necessarily, it's not for discovery at all. It's really uh, more of an administrative, uh, you know, manage, digital preservation management type thing. Like how, what is this file? Um, this is why we embed the original file name. This is why, why we embed the analog source um, ID as well so we can tie them together uh the next question is out of all the tools you demonstrated what would you recommend to organ to to the organizations that to not do have an audio engineers or have that expertise but want to apply digital preservation to their audio files yeah so um i would that's a good question. Um, so a couple of, <laughs> of things. Um, you can work with a vendor. So vendors that, and actually the Association for Recorded Sound Collections, ARSC has a really great directory of vendors that you can refer to who can do what we do and more. <laughs> um, so we worked with one that um, gave us PB Core files, for instance, which is another a thing that we want to do is a METS like structure or even just using Bagot, for instance, that would tie our derivative files together because currently they're not tied together. Um, but if, if we're talking minimal, which is what I demonstrated, I would definitely say if you've got WAV files, uh, broadcast WAV files, which is, which is the accepted standard um, for audio, I would um, highly recommend implementing, and it's really not that difficult, BWF meta edit. It's really simple um, and it's powerful. And the, the QC tool is really, if you don't have that many, then it, you might not, it might not be uh, necessary, MDQC. But if you're running, if you have a big project and you wanna just do a really quick check on the, the metadata that's there, making sure some, all of the uh, required fields are there or they match exactly this, you know, byte for byte, whatever, uh, you can run that. But um, I'd say meta edit is definitely uh, at minimum what you want to do. But you still want to add fixity information too, but you don't have to use AV Preserve, uh, their fixity tool. Um, there's many, many tools for adding fixity information available. Uh, another question is, will you add copyright information to the embedded metadata? Uh, yes, but <laughs> that's another area that our Sound Archive librarian is going to be uh, focused on is because we have this kind of blanket statement for certain materials, um, depending on the project they're working on, but it's probably this is where he's going to do more assessments probably not very um it needs to be a little more relevant to the recording um and so that's something he's going to be working on building in is is for us to do that because we do have some like sound recordings we have very mixed collections in terms of content um when you get them from like a donor um like j david golden who is a collector he has a variety um, so some of the like news programming we can offer free freely and we embed that information we would want to embed that information in the file um, but some of the music programs we might not be able to um, make freely available so again that's something we want to embed into the file but we haven't gotten to that level of granularity yet at some a conversation and a project that we have um, in the near future to address. Um, I don't have a uh, more question here. And thank you, Sandy, for this wonderful presentation. Yeah. And uh, if anybody have uh, more questions, please send a, a question to us and uh, we will forward to Sandy and they will be answered uh, by email. And now we're gonna take a few mi minutes to set up for the next presentation. The next presentation will start at 11.05 Central Standard Time. Bye.